بسم الله الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد إن شاء الله in this session we're going to take a quick overview of the development of tafsir from basically the, a, his, the historical development of tafsir we discussed last time uh, the issue of does the quran need explanation and if so then why and we mentioned some of the reasons for that so uh, we talked about the as time passes we move further away from the uh, the language of the, that the Qur'an was revealed in, uh, even uh, native speakers of Arabic are moving increasingly further away. Uh, and then, of course, it goes without saying that those who are not native speakers of Arabic or don't know, do not know the, the Arabic language obviously will be in need of explanation. Um, so now we're going to, as well as we mentioned that because of the eloquence of the Qur'an, the depth of the Qur'an, there will be meanings that... Um, uh, will not be immediately obvious to everyone, and so they require a great deal of of uh, mastery of language and careful contemplation and study. Uh, so, with that said, if we look at how did Tafsir develop in terms of its historical development, we find that, uh, as we mentioned uh, last time, the Prophet ﷺ explain the Qur'an in the sense of explaining certain verses that were confusing. But this is very limited. There's only a few verses that the Prophet ﷺ explained directly. And otherwise, he explained things that have been mentioned in the Qur'an uh, briefly, but the ahkam uh, require, uh, the, the ahkam that they contain uh, requ require Exposition, such as the ahkam of salah, because we've been commanded to pray, we've been commanded to give zakah, and a lot of the details of how to do so are not mentioned in the Quran. So, th this is also a form of explanation the Prophet ﷺ engaged in. After the Prophet ﷺ passed away, we find that some of the Sahaba start engaging in explaining the Quran, and some of that explanation has been reported to us, and we see this in particular with uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. And one thing that is notable about Abdullah ibn Abbas that we have more of his explanation of the Qur'an than we do of any other Sahabi. We have more explanation of, the, more narrations from Ibn Abbas explaining the verses of the Qur'an verse by verse than we do from any other Sahabi. Even though uh, for example, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was actually also quite famous for tafsir as well, for his knowledge of tafsir of the Qur'an as well. And we have narrations from him explaining verses of the Qur'an, but they are less than what we have from Abdullah ibn Abbas. And uh, Ali radiallahu anhu as well uh, is known for his knowledge of the Qur'an. Other Sahaba no doubt had great knowledge of the Qur'an and understanding of the Qur'an. Yet what we find is that what is reported from them is less than what is reported from Ibn Abbas And it seems that one of the reasons is because Ibn Abbas lived uh, longer than many of these other senior ulama of the Sahaba. And so the, as time passes, the need for explanation is growing. And so ulama are rising to the task of explaining the Qur'an because as we said the Qur'an was in and of itself clear and understood but as need is arising they're beginning to respond to that need so much of the explanation that they're giving is in response to a need part of the reason that now there is an increasingly growing need is that aside from what we mentioned that there that you know there are levels of meanings that not everyone will immediately grasp not everyone will understand versus that people may misunderstand because they're ambiguous and they need to be referred back to 
the rest of the Quran, and obviously this is something that not everyone uh, has knowledge of. On top of this, we have um, people who are newly entering Islam, people who never spent time with the Prophet wasallam, and so they're not familiar with the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam that explains, uh, for example, the verses that are brief, the verses that are brief. And don't, and don't go into detail, the details that are needed, they don't know those details. Uh, many of these verses were revealed in a particular context. And this has two aspects to it. One is that sometimes a particular verse will be revealed as a direct response to a particular incident. And so to, fu to fully grasp, grasp the verse, it's oftentimes important to know what it was revealed about. And so when the, the Qur'an was originally revealed, when the Qur'an was originally revealed, because the Sahaba were living the context in which it was revealed, that context did not need to be explained to them because they were witness to it. But those who come after and were not witness to it would not know that this verse was revealed about this particular incident. And so this then requires explanation. Also, likewise, the, the verses of the Qur'an, uh, sometimes specific verses are revealed, revealed about specific incidents, but also sometimes uh, uh, an entire group of verses or an entire surah will be revealed at a particular time in a particular context. And so, generally speaking, having a knowledge of that time and that context will be important for understanding that verse or that, that surah. So, for example, uh, we find Surah Al-Ahzab, the bulk of it is re revealed about the battle of the Ahzab or battle, the battle of Al-Khandaq, the trench. Knowing that context is important to understanding these verses better understanding them properly. The second half of Surah Ali Imran is for the most part a commentary about the Battle of Uhud. So that requires some knowledge of what happened at the Battle of Uhud. And so if you were not present at the Battle of Uhud or, uh, or, not from, or were not one of the Sahaba who was alive during the time of the Battle of Uhud or in Medina at the time of the Battle of Uhud, someone would have to explain this to, to you. This, um, you will only be familiar with these things based on having studied the reports about them. So these things begin needing explanation. This is on top of the fact that we now are starting to have people who are entering into Islam who are non-Arab. Arabic is not their first language. And so they're learning Arabic for the first time. And so there is vocabulary that is being used in the Quran that is unfamiliar to them. Also, as in the first few generations uh, after the Prophet ﷺ, there is a shift as more and more lands are entering under the rule of Islam and the native people are entering into Islam, many of them do not speak the Arabic language. And so as they're mixing with the Arabs, the Arabs themselves, their language is being influenced by the change that is taking place, the, the change in the linguistic environment that is taking place. Uh, so their language is, their, their Arabic, their spoken Arabic is itself being influenced by the environment around them, uh, as well as those who are newly learning Arabic, who are coming from a non-Arab background, uh, their knowledge of the language naturally will not be as strong as those uh, f whose native tongue it is. So this then requires explanation. One thing that we find that Ibn Abbas anhu does in his explanation and others after him do, and this then becomes a significant feature of uh, tafsir of the Qur'an, is that he quotes a lot of Arabic poetry, particularly poetry from the Jahili period. And you'll find that this is a tradition that continues in the books of tafsir, that they will use poetry for various purposes to explain the Qur'an. So uh, oftentimes you will find that poetry is quoted for explaining the meanings of words. Verses of poetry, the 
seeing the words used in context allows the mufassir to, to demonstrate the meaning of a particular word or to discover, as it may be, the meaning of a particular word. It's then also used to explain grammatical points about the Qur'an and, and other points. So poetry then begins to play an important role in tafsir. Uh, one thing that is to be noted is that we have tafsir that is reported to us from the Sahaba and then more so from the Tabi'een. We find the Tabi'een explain, uh, we give us more explanation or more explanation of the Quran has been reported to us from the Tabi'een than has been from the Sahaba. And one thing that's noteworthy about these explanations is that for the most part they're very short. You will find them in the form of individual narrations narrated by chain, by Isnad, in the books of in the early books of Tafsir. Uh, Fulan reported to us from Fulan, from Fulan that Ibn Abbas said, "Haddathana Fulan and Fulan and Fulan that Qatada said, and so forth. Uh, these narrations tend to be very brief, and so this is the first Tafsir material to reach us. These narrations from the companions and from the tabi'in then begin being collated into collections. And so some of the first tafsirs that are written are collections of these statements of the Sahaba and the tabi'in explaining various verses of the Quran. And this is in the period in the, the this phenomenon um, and it seems Allah that one of the reasons that what is reported to us from them tends to be so brief is because in the very early period of Islam, the first century and a half or so, uh, writing materials were fairly primitive. Uh, people would use whatever materials were available to them. Sometimes people would be writing on 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 the shoulder blades of animals, the bones, they would use those as a writing material. Uh, if, they ha if, if they were a little bit more sophisticated, then maybe they would use, uh, if they had more sophisticated means, they would use scrolls, leather scrolls of some sort. But leather scrolls tend to also be fairly tedious to use. So, uh, you know, l writing large books is not very... Um, uh, it's not something that is very conducive to writing large books when when you're um, when your writing materials are limited, and so uh, in the middle of the second century, in the middle of the second century, the um, the Muslims in a battle. Uh, take prisoner to Chinese experts in paper making. And from them, the, the, uh, the Muslims learn more advanced methods of paper making. And this leads at that time to uh, more expansive writing taking place in all, dif all the different fields. And so, so all of a sudden we start finding uh, larger works being written and with greater frequency than were than what we had in the first century and a half, and so this also extends to tafsir. Uh, so with tafsir, we start having these collections collecting the narrations of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in, and then also we find uh, a new phenomenon, which is that uh, experts in Arabic language, experts in grammar and other the other areas of linguistics start writing also commentaries on the Qur'an focusing on linguistic and grammatical analysis. So there's a very heavy element of grammatical analysis and also some other aspects of linguistic analysis in these commentaries that start being written. So we have two types of commentaries that appear. One is gathering together statements of the Sahaba, statements of the Tabi'in on individual verses. And the other is these uh, linguistic commentaries by expert linguists. Uh, it's, uh, I should note at this, at, the, at this, at this point that um, 
because as I said that we were moving away from the time of revelation and moving away from the language the people are moving away from the language in which the Quran was originally revealed this and this is actually another part of tafsir uh, that f serves the function of tafsir the uh, the the scholars of the ummah really as a whole uh, for the purpose of preserving the religion and first and foremost preserving the Quran both the text of the Quran and the meanings of the Quran undertook massive amounts of uh, uh, efforts really on a civilizational level so it's not just commentaries that are being written on the Quran there's a very large context a lot of things are going on uh, part of that was the preservation of the Arabic language and when I say preservation of the Arabic language I mean preservation of the Arabic language of the time in which the Quran was revealed so uh, for that purpose we find that there is a burgeoning uh, literature of dictionaries and over the centuries um, these the, these efforts start being collected until finally we have, uh, if you look at you know some of the most encyclopedic dictionaries of the Arabic language that have been written. And again, as I said, the focus of these dictionaries is the Arabic of the time of revelation and before it, because that is the Arabic that is needed to be preserved to understand the Quran and Sunnah. The the dictionary literature that has been written for this purpose. Uh, you'll find that some of the largest dictionaries, and these are later works that compile what is in, found in earlier works. Uh, some two of the most encyclopedic are uh, Lisan al Arab and Taj al Arus. Lisan al Arab, the print that I have, is published in ten volumes. Taj al Arus is also Taj al Arus is actually larger than it, and it depends on the edition that you have. Um, but the critical edition of it, the, the, the best, most scholarly edition, and again, a lot of this has to do with um, the, the, type of, um, the type of print that they used and the size of the, the, size of the font and, and, and other factors. But Taj al-Urus, its most recent printing, its most critical scholarly printing, is in 40 volumes. 40 volumes for a dictionary. Basically covering from Aleph all the way to Yah. Uh, because they realize that this level of documentation is necessary to, to preserve as much as possible the linguistic environment in which the Quran was revealed. Because that environment no longer exists. And so to, to really grasp the language, you have to recreate that environment as much as possible. That's with, that's dictionaries. Arabic poetry. Arabic, po and again, remember, remember we said that, that the Arabs were illiterate. The Arabs before Islam were illiterate. So they didn't have any de well-developed literature. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't have any sort of um, what, we would, what we would call um, uh, literary productions, but obviously they weren't in a written form because they were not a literate culture. Uh, so most of that was in the form of poetry. For the most part, this was in the form of poetry. And the reality is, honestly and truthfully, that that poetry from the time at which the Quran was revealed, going back to at least a hundred years, maybe a little bit more than a hundred years before the revelation of the Quran, all of that poetry that has been preserved, and by the way, what's been preserved of it is volumes and volumes. We have the poetry of hundreds of poets from before Islam, from the time of the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, and also the generation immediately following the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, but very close to his lifetime, because all of this period is considered to be the period at which the, uh, the Arabic language, or at least the Arabic language in its highest productions, was still very close to being in the pristine state in which the Qur'an was revealed. This was all preserved for the purpose of preserving the Arabic language. And it's a massive literature. 
and 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 and, and many of these many of these uh, poetry collections, uh, the Arab linguists also wrote commentaries on them. They wrote commentaries on them. Again, all of this, the purpose was to preserve the Arabic language as it was revealed. Uh, so, I can say with uh, full confidence that had it not been for the Qur'an, that all of that poetry, all of the Jahili poetry that has been preserved and continues to be studied to this day, uh, continues to be published and read and studied to this day. Not a line would it, not a line of it would have survived had it not been for the Quran. All of this was done for the purpose of preserving the language of the Quran. So we've talked about dictionaries, we've talked about poetry, another genre. Uh, that may not seem to be immediately of any relevance to tafsir, but it's of fundamental importance, is grammar. Arabic, and this is something that is very uh, noteworthy about Arabic grammar, is that the first work to reach us, the first work to be written on Arabic grammar, is known as Al-Kitab, the book by Sibawai. And this book is considered so great by the Arab grammarians that sometimes they even refer to it as Quran and Nahu the Qur'an of Arabic grammar. Uh, this, book, this book on Arabic grammar, the first real major work to be written on Arabic grammar, is published in five volumes. And, it's, and to give you an idea, Sibawe, the author of, who incidentally was a Persian, in, he was of Persian lineage. Uh, Sibawe, uh, who studied under one of the very famous linguists of his, of his time, in fact, the, the most famous linguist of his time, uh, Khalil ibn Ahmed al-Farahidi, Sibawe wrote this book. And he actually wrote it at a very young age because he died when he was only 36. What is striking about this book is that we don't really have much documentary evidence about the development of Nahu before his time, before Sibawe's book. And again, Sibawe is in that period where, as I said, writing started to explode. That you had a lot of people now writing major works as the, uh, the, the means for writing such works are becoming uh, more and more accessible. Because before, if you wrote, uh, wrote such a big work, copying it was going to be, just the materials for it was going to be a, a, a major task. Uh, so. Now you start having these, these major works that are being written. One thing that we can take away from this is that the Arabic grammar, when Sibawe started studying it, was already a very well-developed and mature science. It hasn't been preserved and written for... We don't really have anything preserved and the sort of detail that we have from him from before him, but what he reports to us in his book is an indication of how much it had already been developed by his time. And the reason that what has reached us from before him is very brief is, again, I think has a lot to do with the, uh, the, the writing materials that existed and the sort of culture, the learning culture that existed before that time as a result of the type of writing materials that were being used. So, uh, one last note about uh, Al-Kitab of Sibawe before we move on. When you read Al-Kitab of Sibawe, one of the things that immediately, or maybe not immediately, one of the things that is very striking about it is that he's very meticulous in observing the various ways in which the Arabic language is used. And, and, and carefully analyzing each and every single usage. And so it then uh, becomes very influential. The, gra the field of grammar in general, and the book of Sibawe in particular, then become deeply influential on uh, the development of 
the field of tafsir. Partly because those first linguistic commentaries that are written, a number of them, are also themselves heavily influenced by Sibuwe. But we will find that, that even contemporary Mufassirin, uh, like Sheikh Ibn Ashur, who died in 1973, at the very beginning of his tafsir, as he's explaining, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, he refers to various passages in Kitab Sibuwe to illustrate certain linguistic points about the meaning of Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So, this is even in explaining the very first verse of the Quran, he's going back to directly to, to the source, not via intermediaries who are recording this. So he's actually going back to uh, Kitab Sibuwe. So there's a, a, there's a host of literature that has been written that in one fashion or another comes back to understanding the Quran. In fact, it would not be an exaggeration to say that the whole product of Islamic civilization, at least what relates to the religious sciences and the Arabic linguistic sciences, all of it really and truly exists. Its purpose is to explain the Quran. That might seem like a bit of an exaggeration because every, every, every culture and every civilization has literature uh, and it develops its, its various sciences once they become comes an established civilization. But one of the things that is striking about the Arabic language, and it is fairly unique to the Arabic language, is that if you study formal Arabic today, if you study Arabic grammar today, you will not learn how the Arabic language is used and constructed by its native speakers today you will still today be reading and studying classical Arabic. Uh, this, this centrality of the Arabic language, particularly the Arabic of the Quran to Islamic civilization is so great that it, that it is probably the greatest example of what the linguists call diglossia. Diglossia is uh, a phenomenon where you have basically two different registers of the language that are in use that are considerably different from one another. So the, na the, so the spoken Arabic, the spoken Arabic, if a person were to, uh, were to grow up in an Arab country today and learn only spoken Arabic, the, sp the spoken slang Arabic that is spoken today, and not formally study classical Arabic, he would find classical Arabic to be almost like a foreign language. And this is more true perhaps in some areas than it is others, because the, even the, 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 the regional dialects vary tremendously. So uh, Arabic, spoken Arabic in Morocco is not like spoken Arabic in Egypt, which is not like spoken Arabic in Saudi Arabia. Uh, also, were it not for the fact that this, if a, if a person were not to study classical Arabic, or what they call uh, al-fusha, if you were not to study classical Arabic, and you knew the spoken Arabic that is spoken in Saudi Arabia, and you went to Morocco, you would not understand them, and they would not understand you because the, the gap between these languages, as, as we said before, languages evolve. Languages are always evolving. And so typically what happens is that the grammar evolves to document this is how the language is being used today. But in the, in the Arabic language and in Arabic literature and civilization, formal, for formal usage, it is still expected today that you use proper classical Arabic, which is, as I said, considerably different from spoken Arabic. The extent to which this gap exists in the Arabic language between the two levels of spoken and formal uh, uh, versions of the language, these sort of, this sort of gap exists in every language. So in English, for example, uh, the, the sort of language that you use in, a, in writing a proper academic paper is not the sort of language you use on the street. That goes without saying. 
But the gap that exists between these two levels is tremendous because in the Arabic civilization there has been a tremendous focus on preserving the original Arabic of the Quran. So, so much so that, uh, that the grammatical cases that are used, by the way, uh, English is, is one of these languages that does not use different grammatical cases in the sense of it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't use what is known as um, conjugation. It doesn't use conjugation of verbs and declension of nouns where uh, each noun or verb will have a different ending based on its function in the sentence. You will change the, the, the ending based on its function in the sentence. Although other languages have this, English is one of those languages that doesn't. Arabic, classical Arabic, has this feature uh, where you have three grammatical cases for nouns and three gr grammatical cases for verbs. And the, the, the Arabic language is tremendously versatile in how it uses these grammatical cases. Classical Arabic. Most, for the most part, these grammatical cases in spoken Arabic have gone out of use. They're not actually used in spoken Arabic. So if you go back, to, but, if you, but if you want to study Arabic grammar formally, if you want to study the Arabic language formally, if you go to an Arabic school, when you are taught Arabic, you will not be taught Arabic and the grammar of the spoken Arabic. In fact, there is no, for the most part, there is no um, formal literature devoted to explaining the grammar of spoken Arabic, modern spoken Arabic. You will learn classical Arabic. You will learn the grammar of classical Arabic. So this is how central the Arabic language, the, 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 uh, the Arabic of the Quran is to Arabic civilization. And it's really, this is something that is striking because this level of devotion to preserving uh, a language in, in its original form after this many centuries is unparalleled in any other language in any other civilization. This is why you find, for example, um, when it comes to the Hebrew language, the Hebrew language and the Arabic language, by the way, are very closely re related. Both are considered to be Semitic languages, and the Semitic languages seem to come from uh, some common historical language from which they branched out. So, in Hebrew, and much of the, the books of the Bible, particularly from the Old Testament, is written in Hebrew. There are words, the meaning of which is lost in the Bible. There are words, the meaning for which is fairly lost. And so you will find some of the modern translations of the Bible, who, in explaining certain verses, they will mention in a footnote that the word used here is such and such word in Hebrew, Hebrew. The word in the original Hebrew is this. And it seems that its meaning is this. How do we know that this is its meaning? Because in the Arabic language, we know that this root is used for this meaning. So, uh, this, contra this contrast is, 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 is illustrative of, of um, the uh, the meticulous care with which the Arabic language has been preserved. So you have 40 volume dictionaries. And if, if, you were, if you were actually to go to an Arabic library and just look at the section on dictionaries, I mean the, the 40, 40 volumes, this is, this, is, this, is, this is the biggest one, but if you were to, if all the published classical dictionaries of the Arabic language, you would need a couple of bookshelves just for, just for the dictionaries. And then you would need further bookshelves just for the Dawawin of poetry, the poetry collections. So you have the collection of Imran al-Qais, Nabigha al-Dubyani, so on and so forth. Uh, 
and then you would need another section, multiple bookshelves just for grammar. And then there are other subgenres that are more directly related to the Quran. So it, it's, a ma it's a massive library. And this is just what is published. So, for example, the Kitab of Sibawe, which I said was in five volumes, it has commentaries. Classical scholars wrote commentaries on it. Some of those commentaries are published or partially published. Some of those commentaries are still in manuscript form and have yet to be published. Some of them are possibly lost. But the point is, it's a massive, massive uh, uh, library that was created all for the purpose of preserving the Arabic language, which was only done because it was necessary to preserve the, preserve the Arabic language in order to preserve the meanings of the Quran and the meanings of the Sunnah. So when we talk about you know, the development of tafsir, we really can't talk about it without talking about these aspects as well, because all of this is part of the effort that the ummah made, or the scholars of this ummah made, in order to ensure that the Quran is preserved. By the way, as a note, these, these, these scholars who wrote these dictionaries uh, you, if you read their, particularly the, the early ones, the ones who were in the first uh, few centuries of Islam, they have, they have a rule. They say that basically the Arabic of the people of the cities after the year 150 is inadmissible as linguistic evidence. Meaning that after the year 150, because of the corruption of spoken Arabic in the cities, you can no longer cite it as proof for this word means this, this word means this, because they moved too far. They said that by this point, and we've basically drawn this as the rough cutoff line that after this point, uh, the the um, you can no longer rely on people's usage in the cities. But as for the Bedouins in the desert, th that line extends to about 300 af Hijri because they were still living relatively isolated, not mixing a great deal. So the Bedouins in the desert, and, and certain Bedouins in certain areas, certain regions of Arabia that were living relatively in isolation, uh, were considered to be uh, still uh, speaking a reliable form of the Arabic language. And so when you read the, the biographies of, of, um, of some of these early grammarians, you will find that they spent years going into the desert and spending time with these Bedouin tribes just to document the way that they speak. Uh, so, um, and to document the way, the meanings of the words that they use, so this goes into to, um, the development of the dictionaries, and also to document the grammatical structures of the sentences. So this goes into the development of, of, the, of the grammar that took place. Uh, and a lot of this was already, as I said, was already going on before the time of Sibawe. Uh, by the way, Sibawe's teacher, Khalil ibn Ahmed, who I mentioned, wrote the first big dictionary of the Arabic language, Kitab al-Ain. It's called Kitab al-Ain because he chose to start with the letter Ain for reasons that I'm not going to go into. Um, so, uh, and again, this is, this is the first major dictionary, first attempt at a comprehensive dictionary of the Arabic language to be written. And depending on the print, I think it's about eight volumes. So uh, again, we see that the, the, the library that, that the ulama of Islam have created for the purpose of preserving not just the text of the Quran, but the meanings of the Quran is massive. It's voluminous. You get, get used to this, that the, the works that have been written are voluminous works. For example, uh, one of the greatest Mufassirin of our times, Sheikh Ibn Ashur, who I mentioned, uh, as I said, he died in 1973. He wrote the tafsir of the Quran. He spent 40 years writing this tafsir. When it was published, for the first time, it was published in 30 volumes. One volume for every juz of the Quran. They're small, the small volumes. Most of the volumes run around 300 pages, so they're not extremely big volumes. A volume could be 500 pages, 600 pages. So it's true, it could be in, in, in fewer volumes. But he published it in 30 volumes. 
he spent 40 years writing those 30 volumes. Uh, so that means that he was spending over a year per volume. Uh, uh, a year and a few months per volume. That's about how long it took him to uh, write his tafsir. And uh, one of the unique things about his tafsir is that his tafsir does not simply regurgitate. You would think after 1400 years, is there anything left to be said? And the amazing thing is that, uh, that in almost every verse, he has something unique to say on top of what the Mufassirin before him have said. So, uh, you know, the, the, the efforts of the Mufassirin in explaining the Qur'an are um, massive. The efforts of the ulama of the Ummah in general in explaining the Qur'an, either directly by writing commentaries on the Qur'an itself or indirectly by developing these fields that served the Qur'an are massive. And, and so this is, this, is, this is important to understand for two reasons. Number one is that, um, firstly, when Allah says that He sent down the book and that He's promising to preserve it, this is part of the preservation of the Qur'an. Preservation of the Qur'an just doesn't mean that the text of the Qur'an has been preserved. The language in which the Qur'an was revealed has been preserved. Because when you, when you want to understand a text, or you want to understand any, something that you're reading, you have to have an appreciation of the language in which it was revealed. Because, uh, and, and it's not simply enough to have a dictionary definition of, of the words. Because language carries with it a certain culture, certain values, certain concepts. So, for example, um, I don't know how good of an example this is, but to illustrate, um, you know, in Western civilization, dog is considered is oftentimes referred to as man's best friend, and it's a symbol of loyalty. There's not anything wrong with that because um, dogs are, in fact, known to be very loyal. But in other cultures, dog is associated, the word dog is oftentimes associated with other meanings, like being unclean. You find, in, for, the much, for the most part, in much of the Muslim world, the, the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about dogs is that it's unclean. So there's, the, so you, so you could give a dictionary definition in, in, the, in the dictionaries, the, the dictionaries that they wrote are written in a style different from what you, would be, what you would be accustomed to with modern dictionaries. So a lot of times the dictionaries will themselves quote verses of poetry to prove uh, the, that this is in fact the meaning of this word. Uh, so this, this sort of depth of understanding of the language of the Qur'an such that you can truly which is necessary to genuinely understand it is not uh, is would not be possible were it not for the preservation of this literature. This is why this is very important, and I know that I've spent a, a, a long time on this point, but it is actually uh, extremely important to understand that um, uh, when we speak about the interpretation of the Mufassirin of the Quran. We have to, you have to understand that this is the weight of the efforts that went behind that uh, interpretation. So when you find people coming along and want to just throw it out, um, you know, just offhand and say, you know what, uh, these people were, you know, a product of their times and, and uh, or, you know, um, uh, uh, or what have you various excuses that are used to throw it out and say we're going to reinterpret the Qur'an. And I'm not saying that it's not possible for someone to interpret the Qur'an. What I'm saying, but when someone makes this claim and they're simply disregarding the, the, this entire literature, this entire library that the, that, that Islamic civil, of Islamic civilization, the, the, the literary product 
of centuries of effort offhand, then this person really doesn't even belong in the conversation. So interpretation of the Qur'an, tafsir of the Qur'an is still possible, but if someone wants to engage in tafsir of the Qur'an, then they need to fulfill these conditions. They need to be uh, not just familiar with, but have a mastery of these various aspects of the Arabic language that you really need to get your foot in the door. If you want to understand the Quran, be able to understand the Quran as it was revealed, meaning for yourself rather than somebody saying that this is what it means, somebody telling you that this is what it means, that you have to have a mastery of all of this literature just to get your foot in the door and so, so that you can claim that you belong in the same discussion as Ibn Abbas, uh, forget the reason, Ibn Abbas, in the same discussion as, as Imam al Tabari and as Mafshari and Ibn Atiyah and Al Razi and Al Baydawi and Abu Hayyan and even, you know, in our time, someone like Ibn Ashur. Because Ibn Ashur, when he wrote this tafsir, he had these qualities this mastery of the Arabic language, this mastery of Arabic poetry, grammar. Um, uh, encyclopedic knowledge of all of these fields and other fields, other fields of, of, of the Sharia such as fiqh and usul fiqh and, uh, uh, and, and what have you. The, so uh, the, 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 these, are, these are basically the entry conditions. If you want to be counted amongst the Mufassirin, these are the conditions to, be, to, to basically get in the door. So, uh, coming back to what we were discussing about the historical development of Tafsir, how long have we been? Uh, how long have we had till Adhan? Uh, another five minutes, I think. Five minutes, okay. Um, but I'll just make a, f- a few points and then we'll pick up uh, next week, inshallah. Um, so, we had the beginnings of these compilations that compile explanations of the Sahaba and Tabi'in and then we had linguistic commentaries. These linguistic commentaries are coming in the context of the, these dictionaries that are being written, these uh, collections of poetry that are being made, the field of grammar that is being developed. So these scholars who specialize in these fields are now writing linguistic commentaries on the Quran. So we have these two two genres. One is collections of narrations of the Sahaba and Tabi'in, and the other is linguistic commentary. Then you have uh, at the hands of Imam al-Tabari. Imam al-Tabari basically merges these two elements. So he brings together the statements of the Sahaba and the Tabi'in, but he's not just compiling. Those who did this before him simply made compilations of their explanation without much editorializing from themselves. He doesn't just compile them, but he also offers analysis of them. Why is he saying this? Why did Ibn Abbas say this? Why did Qatada say this? Why did Mujahid say this? Why did these different scholars get offer these different interpretations? Um, uh, which is the stronger interpretation? And he also brings in the, the linguistic element. So basically when he's writing his tafsir, he has these narrations in front of him, and he also has these linguistic commentaries in front of him, and he himself is, uh, uh, is himself a master of, um, of the Arabic language and grammar and these uh, other attendant sciences. And so he merges between the two, so you find grammatical discussions. But he makes it a point to say that, the, the, that I only bring up the linguistic discussions to the extent that it's necessary to discuss the different interpretations. Whereas when you look at the linguistic commentaries, sometimes the linguistic commentaries um, are offering linguistic analysis of some verses for the sake of linguistic analysis. As a specialist in language, I'm going to look at how is language being used in this verse for the purpose of understanding how the language is being used in this verse. At-Tabari being, his main focus being tafsir of the verse, says I'm going to use it to show how it comes into how the, the different uh, gram- opinions of the grammarians, how they come into play in, in possibly 
giving different meanings or taking different meanings from the verse or, or giving uh, or uh, supporting one opinion over the other. So Imam al tabari begins this trend and this trend continues after him. We find that this, this trend becomes sort of the dominant trend after him that of merging these different uh, facets. And of course we have some people are writing um, brief tafsir that are just summarizing works that came before them. But if you look at the major works, they, they, uh, they continue the, this trend that uh, we find with the Imam al-Tabari. There's another trend that then develops at the uh, hands of uh, uh, Imam al-Zamakhshari, but that will require some, uh, a little bit of lengthy explanation, so I think we'll leave that for next week. Uh, and so the next week we will we'll wrap up this discussion. This is the, the last major point, is about uh, the next major development, which is the role that Ilm al-Balagha plays in tafsir. And this um, uh, is a development that we really see come to fruition uh, or have its uh, first clear sort of manifestation at the hands of Zemakhshari in his, his famous Tafsir al Kashaf. And then this becomes very influential in those who came after him. But this requires a little bit of, um, of explanation of, of what exactly does that mean and where does it fit with what we've discussed so far. Uh, so we'll inshallah leave that for next week. Um, if anyone has any questions, we'll take your questions now. Background noise. Yeah. Okay, I think um, we're done now, so we'll wrap up with that. Subhanakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa